So they always say, you know, like all the people you've ever worked with, who stands out? You know, I always say Nelson Mandela, Mother Teresa. I mean, there's some amazing human beings. But I say, you know, the one that fascinated most, the person I've always told people this, it's Mike Tyson. I said, because I went in there expecting to see this man who was supposed to be so horrific the way people described him to me. And I fell in yeah. love with you. That was 22 <laughs> years ago. And, and for 22 years, I've told people the story of what an incredible Thank man you, you are. Brother. It's That's the truth. So awesome. It's the Thanks. truth. Evan, bring us in, man. Let's just let's, let's let's start the do interview. This. Okay, let's do it. Let's start it up. <laughs> hey, everybody. Welcome to a very special episode of Hot Boxing. I'm Evan Britton. And I'm Mike Tyson. Man, Mike, <laughs> dude, we got an awesome guest. You can uh, feel the energy in here, listen, dude. This is off the hook. It's I don't off know the what's hook. going down tonight. It could be a, a sermon here tonight or something. Yeah. Or get, get, come to the universe. It's going to oh, be interesting. Dude, this, this is, is awesome. We got Tony Robbins. Tony, thank you so much Good for being brother. here, brother. Yeah, really, it's Thanks awesome. Thanks for having me. Good to be here, brother. Thank you, dude. Thanks, man. Um, where do we begin, man? Well, listen, listen. I've met Tony years ago, and I remember when we first started talking, I asked you, how did you first start? And you told me you went to the first, what was it, Denny? What was it, Denny something overnight? Place? You where got did a you good go? memory, Mike. That was 22 one, years ago, man. You went somewhere at like 5 o'clock in the morning. You saw some guys in a restaurant and said, hey, guys, what do you like to do? What's your life like? How do you feel? What do you do? Something I love like that. that. <laughs> yeah, when I first started when I first started learning the skills of how to create change very rapidly, I went to this class and I learned this stuff called neurolinguistic programming. It's how to use language to change the programming of the nervous system. And it was very powerful. You could take like somebody with a lifetime phobia who's been in therapy for 10 years and I'd challenge the therapist. That's how I built my career. I'd go on radio and television and say, listen, give me your worst patient. I handle them in one hour. You know, tell me somebody you've been dealing with for years. And I actually launched my career up in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, because uh, I was up there and I got on this radio show and I didn't know what a shock jock was. It was the early day of shock jocks way back then. I'm older, right? And I got on the show and this guy just tried to, tear me up and he had this guy call in the psychiatrist he said you're a liar you're a charlatan because I kept saying oh, I, no, I, don't I don't care what your problem is I don't care what your problem is I don't care how many years you've been in therapy I don't care if you have uncontrollable phobia see me I'll handle it less than one hour because I am the one stop therapist baby and so oh, I love that and I, you know and then people started calling in saying can you do this can you do that I'm like yes 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 of course yes and then this man calls up and he's, he's a psychiatrist and he said you're a liar you're a charlatan people like you should not be allowed on the radio and I said sir. I said, have you ever met me? He says, no. I said, have you ever met any of my clients? He said, no. I said, you never met me, never met my clients, and you're calling me a, a liar on national radio. I said, are you a scientist? He said, of course, I'm a physician. I said, well, if you're a scientist, you must be stating, you know, your hypothesis because your hypothesis is a majority, right? You don't, you don't have a clue. So if it's your hypothesis, you've got to test it. And I said, why don't we test it? I said, I'm doing a free guest event tomorrow night at the Holiday Inn. I said, bring me one of your patients. Give me somebody you've never been able to cure. I said, I'm sure you got plenty of those. <laughs> it's like, you're going to be rough with me. I can be rough back, right? And long story short, he had this woman he'd been treating for seven years with a lifetime phobia of snakes. You know, phobia is uncontrollable response to a stimulus. And she dreamed the snake would bite her on the face and her adrenaline would go through and she'd wake up three or four times a night, seven years. So I said, bring her down. That should take me 10 or 15 minutes, right? And stir the guy up. And I used to get like 100 people at a free guest event. And I got 500 people show up to see the shootout between me and the psychiatrist. And I brought this woman on stage and I ended up wrapping a snake around her about 20 minutes later. And she was shaking, spitting when I just mentioned snake. And so that opened the door. And then I started working with athletes. You know, I started yeah. with, so I started with, you know, years and years and years ago with some of the top athletes. And, and then it just grew. And then I worked with Nelson Mandela and Mother Teresa and, then I started growing businesses and now now I have 54 companies and we have two, over $6 billion in business in about 12 different industries. And, and I still have my day job where last year I did, what, 108 cities around the world, 18 countries. This year, a little bit more than that. So, and the events go for, as you know now, 10,000 yeah. to 50,000 people. I know. Early. Tell everybody about how many people you fed. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I, well, I was fed when I was 11 years old. On Thanksgiving, we had no food and I never forgot it. It wasn't the food. It was the fact somebody cared. So I promised myself by the time I was 17, I'd feed families. I've had two, then four, then eight, then I got to a million. Then over, gosh, up until six years ago, I'd fed about 42 million people. And then I thought, you know, what if I fed, I was doing this book, Money Master the Game, and I was interviewing all these self-made billionaires, nobody from the Lucky Sperm Club. They all started from nothing. 
And I'm interviewing these guys while Congress is cutting food stamps, they call it the SNAP program now, by 6.7 billion, which means every person without food in America, and there's 48 million people that go to sleep every night, 16 million are children not knowing if they're gonna have a meal. And I was one of those kids. So it's not a statistic for me. So when they eliminated that, you know, it's right now it's like every family that used to get support has to go without food one week out of the month, 12 months out of the year, if the private sector doesn't make up for it. So I said, what if I fed, how many people I fed, 42 million? What if I fed 50 million in a year? And I said, what if it's 100 million? I said, I'm gonna feed a billion people in 10 years. So, so far, we're gonna hit half a billion meals this year, and I'll easily hit the, the billion over the next five years. And uh, it's been one of the one of the most beautiful things in my life to see that what I came out of the pain I came out of the suffering gave me the drive to really help a lot of people, and I'm I'm going to keep expanding that obviously. I like oh, to get involved with awesome. you in that. that yeah, I'd love involved. to have you be involved with that. Brother. That's I'd love to awesome. help out as well. That's really cool. Well, you know, you saw was it Impossible Meats or whatever that just came out? Yeah. I actually have a, I don't know if you know the X Prize, but Peter Diamandis is one of my friends, dear friends and partners in business. And I said, I want to feed a billion people sustainably. Because what I'm doing right now is by doing this for 10 years, we should ramp up and we should be able to provide 100 million every year after that of meals through Feeding America. That's why I set it up. Um, but I thought, there's a billion people around the world coming online that are starving. It's insane. What can I do? So I put together a $20 million X Prize. I put up the first million. And then uh, we haven't made the official announcement, so I can't tell you, but I got one other person put up 19 million. And we have two $10 million prizes. And one of them is, you know, you hear about the new Green New Deal and they talk about, you know, you know, cows produce more flatulence, their methane gas is more than all airplanes and all cars combined. And that's true. Right. But people aren't gonna stop eating meat. So I said, what if we did this? What if we went and did a competition where you could eliminate you know, right now, 80% of the land on earth is used to feed cattle or grow cattle if you get rid of the ice caps, right? Because no one grows Crazy. anything there. That's insane. Crazy. It's insane. We're burning down the rainforest for it. It takes Crazy. this water you got that's so valuable. That water for one cow from the time it's born to the time it's butchered is an aircraft carrier water that they consume. Fuck. And then you have all the mad cow disease and all the elements like that. And you have the pollution of the air. So I said, I'm going to create an X prize, 20 million bucks. 10 million first for somebody who comes up with a protein source where you do not kill an animal, you eliminate 80%. Eliminate eating meat. No more meat eaters. <laughs> well, no, they here's hear me out. They don't, they don't no killing of animals, 80% less land use, 90% less water use, no pollution. And here's what it is: it's stem cell meat. So mm -hmm. it's just oh, wild. I've heard about this. Yeah, it's just heard wild. This. They you can do this right now. You can take the best beef in the world, like Kobe beef. I'm not a beef right. eater myself, but Kobe beef is considered, I guess, one of the best. You can make stem cells, you can grow it. Now the problem is, five years ago or seven years ago, it was $3,500 to make a pound of this stuff. So obviously that's not working well. Then it got down to 350. So now our goal is to get in under a buck 50 so we can feed the next billion people. We're gonna do one $10 million prize that's for this, this protein source. We're doing another $10 million prize that's for a plant source because people in India are never gonna eat meat. You don't want them to. And so we change the planet. We feed people well. Meat eaters get to have the food that they enjoy still if they want to uh, and those that don't want to. And Facebook is now uh, joining us with a $10 million prize it looks like for chicken and fish. So literally we'll have stem cell we call it, it's called clean beef or clean meat because it literally is grown in a matter of weeks. There's no destruction to the animal. There's no pollution. There's no water usage of that nature. There's no land usage. So I'm excited about it. So there's one of the projects I'm involved in. How do you eat? I'm, I, I was a vegan for 14 years. And then I had a unique experience recently in the last three years. I would start eating fish and salad and I was very disciplined. You know, I, I train like a crazy person because I'm on these stages for, you know, 12, 14 hours a day, 50 hours in a weekend. I got to hold 10, 15, 50,000 people at a time when they won't sit for a three hour movie. So the level of energy it takes is amazing. Yeah. But what happened to me about three years ago is I tore my rotator cuffs in a snowboarding accident. I went in to get some PRP and then the guy says to me, you got spinal stenosis. Ah. Look at this spine. No more jumping, no more snowboarding, no more squash. He goes, life as you know it is over. This is his, his way of delivering this communication. He obviously needed some help on his coaching, on his communication style. But I found this doctor in uh, uh, Australia that sent me videos that showed MRIs of the spine re regaining its strength and literally mending itself through hyperbaric oxygen. Mm. And so that shifted my entire world. And then when I went to go do this, here's the final part of the story. He says, before you come to Australia, let's do a cytokine test. Let's do it, you know, see what kind of inflammation's in your body. Because if you wait till you come here, you have to wait a week to get the results. 
I'm in New York and I, I get a test. The guy says, you want to do a metals test also? I said, do you mean like, you know, like what type of metals? He said, you know, all the different metals. I said, well, I had all my amalgams out years ago. It's, I couldn't have mercury or anything like that. He goes, well, there's so much metals in the environment test. And I'm telling everyone this story because everyone should go do a test because 70% oh, no. of the people, but here's what happened. They come back a week later and say, it's an emergency. We must, you must return our call. The doctor said, he saw my side and he said, on a scale from zero to five, where five is totally toxic, I was 123, the highest they've ever measured. He said, how long have you been in the hospital? I said, I'm not in the hospital, I just got off stage. And so the last three years I've been detoxing that. As a result, I can't have any fish. And so now I'm back to land-based protein and vegetables and so forth. And it's a radical change from where I was before, but it's been really rough. I just actually had an experience the other day. I did 12,000 people, four days and nights in London. You know, you know, you came to the event in LA, Mike, you know what it's like. It's crazy, you know, all day, all night, 12, 14 hours, everybody's wired out of their minds. Energy is insane. It's insane. And <laughs> I, I rip it open. I do the whole thing. I come home. I'm exhausted. Well, you should be exhausted, but I felt really tired. I'm running with the dog and boom, I hit the ground. My heart was beaten out of my chest. And I measure my heart. Like I, I have these guys that work with me at these events. I wear this heart monitor that's insane. They use it for the greatest athletes in the world. And it's like I burn eleven thousand three hundred calories. I jump a thousand oh, times. You know, you know, when you're running with somebody, if you can't speak anymore, you know, you're at a four of lactate. I'm at an eight of la eighteen of lactate and still speaking. So I know my heart is incredibly strong. But what happened was I had an ulcer. And it was, I literally lost one third of my blood supply and I pushed through on stage not knowing because I'm so crazy. And so they rushed me to the hospital. I said, holy shit, you could have died. And my blood pressure went from 142 over 92 down to 92 over 67. So it was a rough week. So I'm healing. I got half the hemoglobin I would normally have, uh, but I'm here. <laughs> That's Dude. a long way of saying, if Thank you're listening, you. please go get a metals test because I'd say roughly 65 to 70% of people that I know who got a test, end up finding that there's metals and it's better catch it early before it starts to affect you. Catching um, it early, it. catching it. Most people are so afraid to, to go to the doctor now. It's just a blood know. test. It's not I a big know, deal. but shit, yeah. we're so free. We yeah. forgot what we it's did fun. last year and who we were yeah. last year. Yeah. <laughs> We're so soft. Fuckers could send me some stuff though. Not give it all the mic. That way I wouldn't have to steal it. Evan, Mike's here and he knows you've been taking all of his Mac Weldon stuff, so. What? What do you mean, dude? Evan! Is that hey, my brother. shirt? What do you got my shirt for, Evan? What are you Sorry, doing with man. my shirt, Evan? Why do you do that, Evan? It's Why just, do you always it's the taking most my shirt? I know that you've been taking worn, my shirt man. for a while. Keep the shirts, okay? Okay. But listen, let's make sure this never happens again. Yes, sir. Okay? Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. For twenty percent off your first order, visit MacWeldon.com. Enter promo code Tyson for twenty percent off your first order now. That's MacWeldon.com with promo code Tyson for 20% off your first order. How did you guys meet? We met. Wow, yeah, that's good. Hey, hey, go ahead. No, tell you the go story. ahead. <laughs> so I come in my house. Um, let's see, I'm in my house one day, and I'm in the. I guess I'm in the room, and I walk out in my living room, and I, I see Tony Robbins. I know who Tony Robbins is. I, hey, what are you doing here? <laughs> So I asked him what he's doing here. And I guess um, my wife at the time and some of my friends must have gotten in contact with him and said, hey, Mike needs some help. Mike is fucked up over here. <laughs> Come talk to him. And I guess he came to see me. And well, he it was right like, after, actually, the Hollyfield incident, yeah. right? And so your guys kidding me and said, we need to make sure he doesn't bite somebody's ear. And I said, he's not going to do it again, but I'd love to <laughs> meet him. And so they told me, Mike's all ready for me. He's ready. He wants to meet you. He's a fan of yours. He's going to have a session. I said, listen, I'm not here to push myself. And I mean, no, no, he's ready. I come in here. Mike goes, what the hell are you doing in my living room? <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea what the fuck he was. I was happy to see him, but I didn't know what he was doing here. <laughs> but you know what? I, I've told so many people, and Mike, you and I talked about this the other day, but I've told so, you know, the media always asks me, and I've done this, I'm 59, I've been doing this since I was 17, so, you know, 42 years, God, 100 countries, 17. you know, millions and millions of people. And so they always say, you know, like all the people you've ever worked with, who stands out? And, you know, I always say Nelson Mandela, Mother Teresa, I mean, there's some amazing human beings, you know, Bill Clinton's a really amazing guy. 
And, uh, but I said, you know, the one that fascinated most, the person I've always told people this, it's Mike Tyson. I said, because I went in there expecting to see this man who was supposed to be so horrific the way people described him to me. And I fell in love with you because you're such a love bug. I mean, yeah. first of all, I was blown away by how well read you were. I mean, when you're in prison, oh, you read man. your ass off, yeah, man. Did run. Yeah, you were, he's quoting yeah. Nietzsche and he's yes. quoting the Quran and the Bible. And, and then, you know, you know, I followed up obviously, you know, uh, you know, talking with the guys at the prison, they were talking about how you ended the fights there. And I remember there was one of the things that struck me, Mike, that you said that first night we were together because you were still, you know, agitated because yeah. you're so hurt, right? You know, it's like, you were such a love bug. You know, it's like, we got to do this together. He's talking about in prison saying, hey guys, we can't fight with each other. The people out there hate us. We got, we don't care for each other. No one's going to care for us, right? And how he ended that and he goes, but then you said, Mike, back in those days, he, but then you were really sweet and then you go, and then other days, I think there's a button here I could kill every some bitch on this earth. I push that motherfucker right now. <laughs> you're crazy as shit. <laughs> so you and I, you and, yeah, I, you, and I awesome. awesome. you and I were laughing our asses off in there. I was like, okay, oh, but no. you're Mike but the keeps beauty. It real man, he does keep it real. So I was getting you ready for the next fight, but it's like it was. We had, I was there for two or three hours with you, and I left oh, telling everybody man. he's one of the most well-read. He's one of the brightest guys. Obviously, he's got lots of parts of his personality. We all do. But I say he's truly a love bug, and he's forced to beat people up and be rewarded for it for a lifetime. How fucked up is that? Right? But I'm I mean, saying to myself, as, as you saying, I'm saying to myself, wow, this is fucking Tony Robbins. I really must be fucked up if he's here. <laughs> I say I really must, I really must be wrong. Me, they oh, got yo, Tony fuck. Robbins to get to talk to me and bring him to my house. I'm like, God damn, what is wrong? But 20, what did was, I just do? That was twenty. <laughs> Two years ago, and, and for 22 years, I've told people the story of what an incredible Thank man you, you are. Brother. It's That's the truth. So awesome. It's the truth. What'd you tell him, Tony? Well, we had a long set of conversations. It was a bit circular. Yeah. In the beginning, he said, Go work on my wife. She needs the help. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm talking to his wife on the phone. I was going, Guys, you told me he was ready for me. Go. Oh. So I, we had to kind of gradually work into oh. it. It was really finding his world and finding what really mattered to him. But I just felt for you, Mike, because so many people took advantage of you. I mean, shit. You know, you were hypnotized into this world, right? You 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 grew up in the toughest environment anybody could ever dream of, and I think you navigate incredibly well. And then people don't realize that stress doesn't just come from pain; stress also comes from success. Whenever you go beyond what you think you're going to be, if you know if the thermostat, your comfort zone of of your finances, of your life, of your emotions, your business is set at 68 degrees, and you drop to 62, 60. There's a point the thermostat goes, this ain't good enough. I'm a 68 degree or man, this kick, I gotta do something. You feel the drive to change. Almost everybody's felt that. Exactly. But what most people don't know is if you think you're a 68 degree or mentally, emotionally, spiritually, whatever that metaphor is, and you start doing better than you anticipate, and you become the greatest in the history of the world at 20 years old, People don't understand that when you get to 99, 100, there's a part of your brain that goes, wait a second, I'm at 68 degree. What the hell are you doing here? Mm. And so it goes the end, like this. Let's start destroying yourself. That's exactly mm. right. That feels good, too. Because you want to get back to where you yeah. think you deserve to be, exactly. man, right? And that's what, that's what you do. So I saw that pattern in him back then. It was an obvious pattern. And I had that pattern also, maybe not as extreme in some ways, because I didn't have to go through some of the most extreme things you've gone through. I went through a lot of extreme things, but not as extreme as you might. Mm. Shit happens. Shit happens. Shit happens. <laughs> well, hopefully, shit happens and we make use of it, right? Now. Yeah, hundred percent. Don't let it destroy. You fall us. down a hundred times, you get up a hundred times. You you learn a hundred lessons. That's right, brother. That's right. And I just admired the shit out of it. Like I've always had a level of insane discipline. And what I loved about you is like your edge of being up at four a.m. running in the snow, and knowing your competitors doesn't have that doesn't have that drive. It's pretty. You still have that part of you. And yeah. I just love seeing you today being able to mellow, build your ranch, <laughs> build all the stuff that you've done. I mean, Mike, you deserve it. And people all over the world love your ass, man. They still love you. I'm very after grateful. All these things. I'm very, because they I'm feel your grateful. humility, man. They feel how much you've grown. You're a role model of what's possible, man. You you came from some of the toughest environments. You did some crazy shit. But you've turned your life around in such beautiful ways. It's one of the reasons I'm here, because I respect and love you so much. Oh, and I'm so happy that you're here as well, man. Thank you, and brother. To let you know, anyone in Tyson Ranch love and respect you as well. Thank you, brother. I really appreciate Thank it. Thank you. And no I doubt about it. that, man. Fuck. It's really... <laughs> Wild it's, journey. It's, yeah. Oh, man. But it's, it's amazing. It's just awesome to go on the journey. It and is. never get discouraged. What the else whole thing, do, right? not to be discouraged. That's right. That's one of the most beautiful things about Mike. No matter what happens. I agree. It's like, fuck it. 
get back up again. I don't no, know. They're all learning There's nothing stages else to in do. life. Uh, anybody you've done the same thing in your career, anybody who's ever done anything knows that, but Mike's maybe the most extreme yeah. example of that, right? And I think that's why it inspires people because yeah. you can talk a good game all day long, but it's how you live your life that matters, man. And, 100%. And you, the, the, you know, the little brief interview we did when you're at my house, we sent a little piece of that on Instagram and things like that. And I was so yeah. touched because people get all over people on social media today. It's just insane. But you were so beloved. They just were touched by the, the words that you shared. They're touched by your humility. And and uh, people love you, Mike. You know, from 22 years ago, they still love you. And then so awesome. it's, it's a gorgeous thing. Yeah. It's just life is beautiful, you know? Yes. And I never had time to really um absorb that you know it's really beautiful life at its worst is at its worst it's really beautiful hell a lot better than the alternative right yeah (laughs) not being here right so true man uh what you said earlier about how you fell in love with mike just meeting him yeah because everybody's like he's this ferocious vicious (laughs) warrior man i he has has that in him he's still that oh absolutely (laughs) he's got that look in his eye no doubt but when I met him and I saw how huge his heart is, yeah. I just fell in love with this guy. Yeah. You know? Yeah. What's the most important thing that someone can cultivate, hone, practice in their life to reach their highest self? I think we all, um, motive matters, right? So if you're doing something just for yourself, there's nothing wrong with that because you're part of life. And I think life supports life. That's why we get insights to protect ourselves or be able to do okay. But life supports uh, whatever supports more of life. So when your focus is to serve something more than yourself, I think finding something you care about more than yourself, I don't care if it's your kid, I don't care if it's a mission, I don't care if it's a company, I don't care what it is. Finding something you do more for it than you do for yourself. Most people do that for their own child. That's that's about it. But if you can find something of that nature, it calls to you, it gives you an energy. And that energy is something you can execute, you can change the world with it, you can change yourself with it, you can change anything with it. So if you're just trying to help yourself, you get a certain level of insight. You know, I, I remember I, I fell in love with a lady and married her, and she'd been married twice before me. I had kids from both of these men, so I was, and she was older than I was. She was, I think, 12 years older, so I was literally 24 and had a 17-year-old son instantly. Whoa. Had an 11-year-old daughter, had a 5-year-old son, and then a child on the way. I mean, that'll, that'll flip your brain a little bit, right? And so, but it was beautiful because it made me grow in a different way. I want to serve humanity, but I also want to serve my family. And it just, I had to come up with a different level of set of insights to do that. So I think number one is find something to serve. I think it was, you know, uh, I think it was Martin Luther King who says, a man who hasn't found something he's willing to die for isn't fit to live. It's pretty strong words, but I, I think you certainly won't feel alive until you find that. And so I try to help people to find that within themselves. But the other part to me is just realizing life's not just about me. It's about we. The secret to living is giving. I, Mike's a giver. You know, I, Evan, I don't know you. I haven't met you before, but I can just feel your energy about it. Like you're here to contribute. You're not here to, to take. I mean, I came here today to hopefully give. I'm hoping some of the people listening, between the three of us, there'll be some conversational stimuli. Maybe it'll be something about their health. Maybe it's something about their finances. Maybe it's something about their family. But I want to be a, my daily wish is to be a blessing in the life of anybody I meet. Sometimes I can do that just like you, Mike, because somebody meets you and just, just meeting you lights them up, right? Because, you know, they perceive you a certain way or they've been touched by you in the past. I have that experience. Sometimes it's digging in and saving somebody's life who's suicidal. You know, it's like I, I deal with the realm. People come to me at extreme. They come to me because they're the best in the world. They're looking for that edge. That's how they stay the best. They come to me when they're in a tough spot, when they've you know been the best and there's a challenge. Uh, that's like how we got hooked up. Or somebody has uh, you know a change in their life, a, a birthday with a zero on it, you know, or they got a divorce, or they're starting a new business. I, who my market is is people that are hungry. If you're hungry to grow, then I, you're my market. If you're that lukewarm middle. I'm not for you because I'm too passionate, too intense and too crazy. And you don't need this shit for, to hang out with me. But if you're looking to have an edge in the body, the mind, the emotions, the relationships, the finances or your business, the areas that matter, I've spent 42 years studying the best on earth. And it's not my insights. It's I believe in modeling. I believe success leaves clues that if someone is the best on earth at something, they're not effing lucky. And, you know, somebody could lose weight and gain it back. Somebody's lost weight and kept it off for 20 years. Somebody has fallen in love and are still passionately, you know, in a relationship 20 years later. So any of those things, somebody started with nothing and 20 years later, anybody can get rich. Can you stay wealthy? That's a different game. And those are the people I want to find out what makes them. Because, listen, I'm no dummy. I mean, most people are not fit and healthy in America. Most people do not have great relationships. Most people are not earning what they deserve or what they want. Most people are not really that happy. 
But a few are, and I'm interested in the few who do versus the many who talk. And I'm interested in finding out what they do and teaching it to people so they can change their life. Awesome. <laughs> You're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I heard somebody say you called Mike the ultimate redeemer. Is that right? Oh, I think we used some language like that. Yes, I think he's just, I just think he's the ultimate role model of what's possible for people. I mean, yeah. you know, the only thing I hate is that today so many people want to hold somebody in place uh, for some the way they talked or spoke or did something 20 or 30 or 40 years ago, whatever the number is. It's so absurd. We all were idiots at times and we grew. Yeah. Right. And the, the, the definition of a man or a woman is not what they did or what they were. It's who they are and it's how they deliver and it's how they live and it's how they treat people. And, how, and so you look at Mike and he's the perfect example of the extreme of one side to the extreme of the other now. And that's why I think he's he's such an inspiration. Well, you're getting a lot of credit here today. I'm listening. I'm, I'm, I don't know where this is coming from. I'm lost in words, man. But it's all true, brother. Well, thank yes, you. So but I do have one bone to pick. You stole my logo here for your ranch, really? man. <laughs> this is my logo on my plane, dude. That's pretty TR, awesome. Tony TR. Robbins. That's great. <laughs> I love that. Tyson Ranch, Tony Robbins. <laughs> Same That's thing. such good energy, <laughs> dude. It's awesome. That's cool. You and Mike have something in common. You've both. What's this? You've both uh, had okay. a pretty impactful experience with the toad yes we yeah. have and i would be like the last person to consider it i'll tell you how it happened for me is i feel like you know no matter what somebody has to deal with, it's not like i'm so brilliant but i've been doing this 42 years and there are only so many patterns so i get the call when you know the athletes burning down on national television and i got to do something right now and there's no net everybody's paying attention right so like the old days you know it's see serena williams and her sister you know got killed and can't get, I got to turn her around now, you know, or I get the phone call when the child is suicidal and, you know, knock on wood, I've never lost one suicide out of thousands in 42 years. And we have films If some people listening may have seen, uh, uh, there's a Netflix documentary called Tony Robbins, I'm not your guru. Yeah. Yeah, and in it, you can see where I work, deal with these suicides one after another and all kinds of people, but suicides are the most extreme. And so I've learned how to do that and, and learn how to produce the result, make it last. Um, I get the phone call when the president of the United States calls me, true story. Uh, and says they're going to impeach me in the morning. What should I do? Not Trump, <laughs> right? This is Clinton back in those days. But he says they're going to impeach me in the morning. What should I do? And I'm like 31 years old. And I'm like, dude, could you call me sooner? It's tomorrow morning, <laughs> right? But because I had to do that, I had to constantly look for patterns. And once I realized we are not our patterns, like whatever you do, like we're the only creatures on the planet that can make ourselves angry with a single thought. We can then have a different thought and be grateful. I didn't thought be excited. I didn't thought be pissed off, right? And so I really became fascinated in patterns. But the one pattern that I felt impotent in was helping somebody when they're dying. And the reason is because, frankly, I think what drove me to be so successful and squeeze every moment out of my life was uh, that I don't want to die. And I don't think anybody wants to die. But I think early on in my life, I had this fear of death and I wanted to maximize the time I was here. And so that push drove me, but it made me not really know what, what do I do with somebody who's told they got terminal cancer? It just crushes me because I, I love people. I hate seeing people in pain. I, my whole life is about ending suffering for people. In that one area, I didn't know what to do. So I, I met this Dr. Grob from UCLA, and then I met Tony Bossis from NYU's medical school. And they've been doing this research on cancer patients, and they do veterans and a series of others. But the one that grabbed me the most was terminal cancer patients, where they were using, uh, at that time, mushrooms, psilocybin. And Tony Bossis, by the way, is a beautiful man, and I've become good friends with him. And he was saying, Tony, let me show you these videos. And he would show me, you know, it's a double blind study, and, you know, they put a mask on somebody and they give them this medical level of psilocybin or they give them, a, you know, obviously a sugar pill. And he said, these people have a one-time experience and their life is completely altered. He said, when you think of drugs, most people think of drugs, something you got to keep taking over and over again. He said, this is a one-time experience that permanently changes people where they no longer have a fear of death. And I was like, I want to see this. He goes, he showed me this video, this woman. He goes, now, before I show this, this woman sounds harsh. She goes, she's told me up front, as you'll see in the video, that she said, she's not just an atheist. She's a New York atheist, not a California atheist, where there might be some nice rainbows and shit like that. A New York atheist. There is nothing, right? <laughs> and he showed me the video of her in advance. And she's got terminal cancer. And he shows me after she's had this experience of three and a half hours, you know, with, and that's that case with psilocybin. And the woman is completely transformed. She has experienced God. She knows there's God. She has no fear of death. Her whole family's transformed. 
So I've actually actually helped to fund some studies and I'm actually now working with him to see if we can raise the money. I'm going to be a part of that process to bring a series uh, on a mom, a priest, and a rabbi and a group of different religious leaders to have this experience so they can share what they experience through their language to, to people in that area. But I'm interested in veterans and I'm interested in the death experience. So I went down to Brazil and I had an experience there with ayahuasca in the Amazon, which was wild That's shit. intense. Very intense. But as intense as that was, and I'd done all the research on it, and the thing that was interesting to me is, and all these people that are depressed take these SSRIs, you know, it's Prozac mm. and all this crap. It's like 15% of the population takes something of that nature in the US, it's insane. But they're not, you know, I know people, and I'm sure you do, that take multiple SSRIs, and they're still depressed. They take antidepressants, yeah. they're still depressed. Horrible. Because they haven't changed what's going on inside. So I go to change what's going on inside, but I want, I heard about, and I started reading about the pain receptors and the dopamine receptors being changed by ayahuasca, like increasing it so that joy could be maintained with someone. So I said, I want experience of it. So I went to Brazil, it's legal there, and had the experience. But then this little character, <laughs> tell, him, tell him about your experience the other day, and then I'll tell him about mine. Okay, so listen, I'm on um, <laughs> five meo the, the yeah, toad five meo top of the pyramid yeah, the the toad. I'm yes. doing a a podcast. I'm talking to somebody and he's talking to me about this medicine and I'm listening and I said, let me try this. Where is it at? He said, I have some. I said, well, let me try it. He said, well, then after the show you can try it. So I'm listening. I said, I can't even tell me this is good. This is magical and this is. Yeah. This is a God monocle and this and that. You ever hear about the toad? And so we go in there, we, I smoke the pipe, we sit down on the floor on a mattress to smoke it, and it hits me, boom, and I'm gone. <laughs> I am gone. I don't know where I'm in another dimension. Yeah. I am gone. I have no body. I have nothing. I just have my energy. You don't exist, but you do. I'm getting a thousand years of information within 15 minutes. So yeah. you imagine how fast it's coming to me. Dying has to be glorious because life is glorious. So life can be glorious if death wasn't glorious. A thousand years just coming at you as fast, everything. And um, I guess I, I'm dead. I fucked up. I fucked up. I guess um, I was trying to prove something that I could handle this drug and it killed me. I fucked up. And so um, I was just dead. Everything I ever loved, my children, my wife, my family, anything I loved, my friends, they didn't exist. I never thought about them. Never mentioned them, and they just never exist in my world anymore. I had nothing but me. What happened? Excuse me, huh? And what happened? Um, in that in that particular situation, um, I just woke up. And I think you shared. Is that when you stopped using cocaine? Because you told yeah. me, yeah, it literally yeah, stop, stopped you from doing it, right? Stop using drugs. Stop drinking. Stop in that. I didn't want to do that no more. So I did that. So I took another hit of the toad. Yes. What happened the second time? Um, the second time was um, it was smoother. Yeah, it wasn't as um, so I did it recently too. Again, so I did it all together. I must have did it five times. Wow! Holy shit! <laughs> That's intense. <laughs> yeah, I must have did it five times over a period of time. Yeah, over a period of time. Yeah, and what do you think is the biggest impact that's had on you? It, you just um, it, 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 um, it attacks your consciousness. Yeah, it does. You don't want to do fucked up shit. You're very aware this is gonna put me in the wrong direction. I don't want to go that direction. You only want to improve yourself, and and you want to understand yourself. You want to understand this. And I re and I think in life, people if they never get living their life, they never get a chance to understand who they are and what they are. I think is a wasted life. I agree with you. Them you know, to not have self awareness. I mean, one of the beautiful things about you, Mike. Again, you're getting all these compliments, but it's sure they're sincere. Is your self awareness, right? Your your ability to see who you were and your ability to step out of that and be, choose who you wanted to become. And a lot of people have a hard time doing that. My experience with the five MEOs, they they told me advance. They go, this is very intense stuff, which again immediately pulled me in. Right, I, I don't use drugs of any sort. I never have. I've been honestly, I don't drink. I don't smoke. I'm I'm not a prude. It's just what made you want to do 
Mm-hmm. Well, because in my family, my mother, who's probably the one influenced, not probably influenced me the most, I love her dearly and huge influence in my life, but she used prescription drugs and alcohol, abused them both, and she was crazy. It would beat my head against the wall until I bled and <laughs> oh, pour no. liquid soap down my throat until I threw up, saying I was lying and I wasn't. And I'm not, I'm not being derogatory towards her. She's passed. I didn't talk about this until after she passed. And even then, I didn't talk about it until I was with a group of kids that were all abused. And I was trying to tell them, your past doesn't equal your future. Your biography doesn't define you, brother and sisters. But, you know, they look at this tall white guy that's, you know, wealthy now financially and thinking, oh, yeah, easy for him. So I thought, fuck it. I told them the whole story. It's the first time I ever told anybody. And they were all crying their eyes out at the end. Um, but what I want you to know is, out of all that shit, it made me a practical psychologist. It made me want to understand what makes people do what they do and made me want to have no one suffer. But I, in the area of death, like I said, I suffered even thinking about it and I suffered that I couldn't help anybody. So I did the ayahuasca and then they said, um, now we have this toad thing. I said, toad, what the fuck is that? You know, 5-M-E-O and like, tell me about it. And they go, oh, the God molecule and all stuff like, like, what are the side effects? No side effects. Nothing has no side effects. Don't give me this bullshit, right? And so finally I, I was there. I spent the day reading everything I could about it. And I finally said, you know what? The ayahuasca was a great experience, but I still didn't feel like it transformed my death experience for me. And so I did it. And so they told me in advance, they go, you're so big, you know, you're 6'7", 280. We need like four or five guys to hold you down. We're going to tie you down. You're going to tie me down with it. And they go, because we don't want you scratching your eyes. You, know, you're, you could get crazy in this. And I said, how long does this last? They go, 10, 12 minutes. So they give me this stuff. And nothing happens. And they, they gave me a ton because I'm big, right? They gave me a ton. It's like, that's, they told me that should be enough to take out an elephant. And I'm like, well, fuck, I don't feel anything. This is bullshit, right? Nothing happened? Nothing. So the next day, they said, we're going to try it again. And I guess they really loaded me up. And <laughs> I went out. But, but I, I had at that point, I had some problems in my throat and I was having sleep apnea. And so as I went out, I couldn't breathe. And I was screaming, I can't breathe. I felt like I was dying and I kept rolling and, and they couldn't control me. I was running all over the place. They tied me down. I ripped out of the tied areas. <laughs> it was crazy. And this 10 minutes was two fucking hours. Fuck. Because the amount they gave me. What the fuck? But here, the first hour was hell. And if you'd see me, you'd think it was insane. And, you know, I, I guess my eyes were open, but I couldn't see anybody or see anything. Um, and then the last hour was one of the most beautiful experiences of my life, which is what Tony Bosses had kind of alluded to before. It's like I felt the direct connection to all that is. I felt the direct connection to spirit, to soul, to my own soul. I had this conversation with myself that I'll never forget from my higher self to me. I felt the presence of God. My wife was with me and I you know, looked at her and felt like if I died, she was the greatest gift that ever happened to me. I already felt that, but it was even deeper. I felt so much gratitude. I mean, I came out of the experience with uh, a transformation like you did. Only only difference is for the next 10 days, I because I guess the amount they gave me, I woke up every morning and had this euphoric experience, but euphoric, but I was like making sounds, like yelling sounds to get the <laughs> vibration out of my body. And it would go on for like 30 minutes of like ecstatic feelings, but so ecstatic. You know, if you smile so much, your face hurts. It was like, this shit needs to stop. And then like, I, I, I done this down there and I come up from Brazil and normally like every, you know, every three or four days I'm in a seminar. So I had this one 10 day period and the 10 days were up and I had to get on stage in Vegas in a crowd of 12,000 people. And I'm having this experience right in the morning before it starts. I'm like, holy shit. And th- my brain just overrode it. And I got on stage and I delivered and I never had that experience again. But literally I had 10 days in a row of this euphoric experience and my whole nervous system getting rewired. And so I have no fear of death. Now I'm going to say fear of death. I don't want to die, but I have no fear of death. And more importantly, now I can really help people in that environment. It's transformed me in that area because you can't get someone to feel what you don't feel. You can't touch other people if you've not been touched. You can't move other people if you've not been moved. And so I had a direct experience because I, I read all about this shit, but then, you know, I didn't want to be a part of it because, you know, my background, everybody around me was abusing drugs and alcohol and they were abusive. So I never wanted to touch this shit. But in this case, it's like I always tell people, you know, a belief is a poor substitute for an experience. You can believe all you want what something is. And one other person, um, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, I really want to acknowledge him. I love him. He's a beautiful man, you know, from CNN, medical doctor, neurosurgeon. And he was about as 
straight laced about this shit as I am and like on marijuana even, he thought it was horrible. And you know, he started doing the studies and research and he started telling me about the research about like kids that, you know, as you're having, you know, brain aneurysms and things of that nature, or yeah, uh, brain seizures. seizures rather, and how, what an unbelievable gift it was. And now, as I'm sure you've seen, he's a supporter of it yeah. and so forth. So the world's changing. And I think we reacted to the abuse of things. But what I liked about these experiences is I could do it one time and have my life be altered. I don't have to do it. It's not something I got to go do daily to bring myself back to that state. I have access to those states within me because I locked them in and they're, and they're valuable and they, they, they give me great gifts. So the toad has blessed us both, my friend. Oh, big time, big time. <laughs> one time I took the toad recently and I felt the pain of everybody that I ever hurt. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's wild. And did you let it go afterwards? Yeah, I let it go, but it was, it's incredible. I felt the oneness of every... Uh, it was, ooh, the oneness is what that experience yeah, is the most powerful. the oneness powerful. with the rock, a with flower, everything. air, yeah. water, just everything. You everywhere. I feel every drug, every <laughs> took, any drink or water, every took, I feel everything. It's just crazy. And you just think about how people are so separated today. You know, you look at social media, you so look at the mental health of this so country. So disenfranchised. Yeah, it's it's crazy. crazy. Yeah. We have, I don't know if you saw the statistic the other day, one out of every, well, first of all, since 1990, was it 1992 to 2014, so f what, 12 years, the use of antidepressants increased in America by 65%. And suicides exploded during that time, even more so. It's just on the side of the packaging of most of the SSRIs, you know, it can create suicidal thoughts. Oh, I was depressed, now I'm suicidal. Really, really great thing. It's just crazy the way we have a drug culture, and yet we don't look at some of these natural remedies, like what, what right. Tony Bossis, Dr. Bossis was telling me from NYU's medical schools. He's saying, Tony, these, there's receptors in your brain that are tied to these mushrooms. The mushrooms have been around as long as humanity is, and those receptors have this specific impact on anybody that takes it. He goes, that's not just random, yeah. right? There's something here. But we reacted to the 1970s, the Nixon years, when people were just partying and using shit to party. It wasn't any form of consciousness. And so we've created and put people in, in prison over those no stupid things. And people just trying to change their state and they don't know a better way than using a drug. Uh, and for people trying to, you know, trying to be part of it. It's a, you know, we're talking about these breakthroughs. I'm, I'm actually doing a book right now on life force and it's all the regenerative medicine. But the thing I wanted to mention for anybody listening is I care so much about, you know, you got so many vets coming back that have gone so many tours of duty. It's insane. Their lives are destroyed with PTSD and I know how to deal with it. I've turned it around, but I'm not scalable. There's only so many hours I can put in with, you know, a small number of people. Um, but there is a doctor named Dr. Lipoff in, in Chicago that I just recently met. He has found a way to wipe out, I know it sounds insane, but it's a fact, PTSD with two shots in one session, 92% successful. He's an anesthesiologist. Now, what's his name again? Dr. Lipov, L-I-P-O-V. I'll get you the contact so that anybody watching is interested can find out. I'm going to sponsor I'm paying what for 100 What is it? It's, it's, you know, most people know that your nervous system has a sympathetic and a parasympathetic. Yeah. Sympathetic, as you know, is go, go, go. And most of us have been go, go, go most of our lives. Yeah. You found parasympathetic, I think, through some of your yes. indica, <laughs> yes. some of the approaches. But what it does is an anesthesiologist, he knows two places that it interrupts the pattern of being, that accelerator being stuck, mm -hmm. which makes like, the first guy I ever worked with, he told me, was a man who was, they took him away because he's going to kill his wife, and he wasn't trying to kill his wife. He was just in the experience of being back in Iraq all over again, and he was strangling her mm -hmm. to try to survive. And he came in and did, he wanted to kill himself, obviously, because he didn't want to kill his wife. He wanted to kill himself to get out of this horrible situation. It was the first one he worked with, and he did this one shot in this one location, and it didn't work, and he did a second one. After doing two, he found the right combination. And the man is totally healthy and fine today. He has no reactions. They still have the memories, but there's no emotion to the memories. The amygdala, the part of the brain that makes us react with incredibly intense emotions, it blocks that pattern around this experience. So I'm sponsoring 100 vets, and I'm sponsoring 30 women who've been um, been through sexual rape and, and abuse. I, I'm part of Underground Railroad. I don't know if you guys heard about it, but it's all the former. No. Oh, they're a great group of guys. Former CIA, former FBI, former SEAL Team 6 guys that have all banded together to go underground railroad to free young girls and boys around the world. But what they do is they go in and they trap the guys. I actually, I can't tell you where because then the flashback come on me. I had full movie makeup. I had scars all over my face, the whole thing. And I went through a three-day process where we trapped 37 of these perpetrators. And the girls wow. we freed, there were 42 girls we freed. 
and they were from the ages of seven to 14, chained to a bed, being given heroin and cocaine, mostly cocaine, so they'd have sex with these men. It's the most gross thing I've ever seen in my life, but the most beautiful thing was seeing them free. But then the problem is, they're free, but there's all the torture yeah, inside. Tom, man. So I'm gonna I'm sponsoring that group as well, and I want to try and help get this guy's work out. It's already been duplicated at, in, in the army in several different locations. Uh, Fort Hood's one of them, um, but he wants to take this to a larger scale. So I just thought, as long as we're talking about these kinds of breakthroughs, yeah. if somebody knows somebody about that, they should look up Dr. Lipoff, and I'll get you the contact info. So if they go to your website or something yes. like that, they could find out more about it. But That's it's amazing. a one time session, ninety two percent. The, the total rate. is pretty good with trauma too. The toad is too. <laughs> That's true, but I don't know. I don't know if the toad would be the right thing for everybody on a vet who's already kind of in a wild state. But this also, what's nice is it's it's medical. It's done, you know, by an anesthesiologist. They know what they're doing, uh, and just want people to know that there's an answer out there because there are men and women that are tortured. Twenty two. I think the number is twenty two veterans a day take their own life still. Yeah. It's insane. We have a lot to change, but look, in this country, there's been a big change around marijuana, obviously. Why are we as human beings, yeah. we as human beings, funny, why don't we like who we are? Why do we have? To, why do we want to change our state? I think it's because, you know, we are, live in a social culture and people are constantly making comparisons and I think the mental health has been challenged. You know, I'm sure you've seen the recent studies. Uh, there was a 2019 study by Gallup saying it's one of the angriest, most unhappy times in most countries of the world that we've ever had. You see these great athletes in the NBA, uh, you know, the one that the NBA commissioner was talking about and some friends of mine or team owners were telling me about it, saying these guys are the most unhappy they've ever seen for two reasons. Number one, they all live in their own world. They got their headsets on. You know, it used to be like Jordan used to say, you build championship teams on the plane between cities. You know, it's like there's a, there's a camaraderie, but everybody's got their own world. Not everybody, but many. And, you know, and then in addition, there's all the social media. So a guy makes a mistake and people just burn him over and over and over again. And so these guys are living a lonely life. And a life where, like, you look at it like like a guy like Harden, you know, or LeBron. These guys are, are some of the greatest athletes. Or you know, yeah. you look at the Warriors, and you can name a number of members of the Warriors, right? And they really take so much crap today. It's such a different world, and so it's hard for them to be able to find a balance. But I think what it is is we're all making comparisons all the time, and our culture has been more significance driven. Anything to be significant, significantly bad or significantly good, something significant. And the problem with significance, and when you're always making comparisons, you can never find you. Mm. And I think what people really want is love. I mean, you told me yeah. something, Mike, that I'll never forget. Yeah, when we met 22 years ago in your house there, and we were in your training house in, in Arizona, and I remember I, I somehow we got on the subject of of the white black thing and how people treat each other, and and you're telling me about the Sally Jesse Raphael show that you saw with this white uh, this supremacist, and he's got this you know shaved head, and he had a uh, across his chest f you know the n word. And I was asking, what do you think is wrong with him? Why do you think you do that? And you were so brilliant. You said, you know. He wants power because he doesn't have love. <laughs> and I was like, holy shit, man. That's, that's what's like. This guy's so brilliant. And I think people really want love, but our culture is promoting significance. Power. I mean, people, one of my buddies owns a gym and he was telling me like, at least twice, sometimes three times a week, people come in, lay out a whole workout, take all these pictures and they don't work out. They send it. There. There's a new company I just saw that you can put your picture in and it makes it look like you went on vacation, these fancy places. I mean, I read a study the other day. Millennials say they believe they're the most stressed out, you know, uh, generation ever. I saw this thing today, a headline saying more young people are having dying of heart failure than ever before. But I'm you know, like, you know, holy but fuck. But when you don't, when you, it's like a child, if a child never breaks a bone, if you never let the child, if you protect the child, and they never fall down, they live in fear their whole life. But somebody who's jumped off a building or done a few crazy things and broken their bones and healed them, like, you don't have any fear because you know, hey, I'm going to heal, right? So we've got not everybody, but we've, because of technology, it's nobody's fault. And because a lot of parents raised their kids where they micromanaged everything for them, that now they want, they want that to be the way the rest of the world is. That the world's got to match their view. And I, I say, look, what's beauty about life is diversity. You want to see what God loves? You want to see what the universe loves? Whatever you believe, go to the forest. Everything is different. Every stick, every twig, there's similarities, but everything's different. But this idea that we're all supposed to think the same way, be the same way, agree on everything, it's like what makes me so upset is you see people making enemies of the other side. I remember when I worked, I worked on both sides of the aisle politically to help people on both sides. You know, Republicans and Democrats, obviously. I'm independent myself. Um, but I remember in the days when I worked, I knew Reagan. 
And I got a chance to see him, you know, get to him know briefly. But those days, they would go, and the opposite sides, what's his name, the guy from Boston, who was his arch rival in the Democrats, the guys would fight on the House floor like crazy. And then they go have a beer and laugh and, and be friends. Now, if you talk to this side, you're evil. That's why nothing gets done today. We got to stop this demonization. We've got to start to remember we're all brothers and sisters that, yes, everybody's been hurt. Everybody's had injustice in their life, and everybody's made mistakes. But the secret is, what, what can we do now? How do we move the ball forward instead of living in the past? Because the past doesn't equal the future unless you live there. And if you try to drive in the future using a rearview mirror, you're going to crash. I think it's like we got to create the new future. And I think people are getting sick of it. People are getting tired of this yeah. extremes on both sides in the political environment, regardless of what you're, where you are in the political environment. Too I think much people hate. Are just tired. There's so yeah, much hate. hate. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. It's got to change. And so I think... The pendulum is thrown so far, I think eventually it's got to balance out, and I think it will. It's such an interesting dynamic of as we get more comfortable, more comforts to take care of yes. us, we get more sensitive. That's right. Yet we get more extreme in our views. And, and Fucking bizarre. <laughs> what's man. most of bizarre is... Uh, I want I want everyone to believe what I believe, right? Yeah. <laughs> I want you to have the ability to say whatever you want, think whatever you want, but as long as it aligns with me. I mean, and it's it's being done by both right and left extremes. It's not. We live in such a big manic world of fear. And look, and everybody's medicating too. That's the other yes. thing, right? You know, you see the one out of six Americans is using some psychotropic drug right now to medicate themselves. One out of three are using something that relates to either anti-anxiety, anti-depression, something of that nature. That statistic blows my mind. How many people well, using cocaine? I don't know. Well, I know this. We're 4% of the world's population. In America, we use 80% of the world's cocaine. There's, a, yeah. there's something yeah. going on there. <laughs> we getting fucked up over here. <laughs> well, don't this you think? Crazy. Crazy. We, we, we spend more money up. on alcohol than we do on education. We wonder why we got a problem, right? Don't you think it's the exact thing that you help people with? It's because nobody in this fucking country feels like they have a purpose or they are aligned with their true self and who they are. I think lots of people do. I don't think it's nobody. I think lots of people do. But I think what happens is there's a small number of people. It's like weapons. You used to, like, if you and I were going to have a conflict, you're a big son of a bitch. I am too. We'd go at it. But there'd be a price to pay. So we think it through, right? You know, is it really worth it? But now you can burn somebody online or you can attack right. somebody without with immunity. And so there's no consequence for things anymore. And so there's no balance. But I think what's really truly happening is a small number of people, just like weapons now, now somebody can blow up an entire city with one little bomb. Now with social media, a small number of people or in a university, a small number of people can kind of dominate because of the use of social media. And I think we're going to find our balance. We have to because mm -hmm. we're, we're humans and we need each other and we're brothers and sisters on the path. And the more divided we are, the more unhappy we are. We have to unify. And it doesn't mean we all have to agree by any stretch, but we got to unify to the point of saying, hey, you can have a different point of view. It's like, it's like guns. Everybody, what, everybody, the other side, whether you believe in guns or not, the other side's evil. That's the way they operate. They're taking away my guns. They're evil. They have guns. They're evil. How about what do we all agree on? We all want our kids protected. We all want our schools protected. We all want our churches protected. That's where we should be putting our focus instead of how evil you are because you have a different solution than I do. Yeah. Whatever that solution is. Fuck. We'll get there. What's your thoughts on where we come from? If we're all we're all brothers Who and sisters. <laughs> Who are we? I think we're soul. I think we're spirit. I think uh, you What's know I've had, I've had some experience. I think we, I think our <laughs> everyone has a unique our own purpose, and I think it. Some people try to make it so big when, you know, one purpose isn't more important than another. It's like I, I'm driven to try to help, you know, tens of millions of people. And I've been able to do that, but I had to help myself first, you know, and I still do. Um, but at the same time, you know, if I help save one person's life, bring one person's life there, that should be enough. Now, for my model of the world, it's not. But I know it's enough intellectually. You know, my wife is better at like, gosh, if we just help one person. She's like, honey, we don't have to go travel over the earth this much time or anything else. I'm like, yes, we do. I got to do this. This is what I'm made for. And she respects that. But, you know, I watch her and she's brilliant with people one-on-one. -on -one. I'm good with people one-on-one. -on -one, but she can do something one-on-one -on -one and be totally fulfilled by it. So some people, the fulfillment is writing a poem. Some people, it's raising a beautiful child. For some people, it's having a gorgeous garden. For some people, it's writing a beautiful yeah. song. For some people, it's like bringing a new level of education. For some people, it's bringing, you know, new answers in the medical field. We all have something to deliver, but people have to find what that is. And it doesn't have to be giant. It just has to be fulfilling. Mm. That's what's giant. Most people are not fulfilled. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you look around and you see, 
I always tell people there's two skills you got to master to have life on your terms. And to me, an extraordinary life, an ex extraordinary quality of life is life on your terms, not how I think it should be, right? So what would that look like for you? And what gets you there is two skills. One is mastering the science of achievement. Like you've done that, you've done that, I've done that. Like how do you take your dreams and make them real? Now, most people just have a story in their head, but they never make it real. Learning how to do that in multiple areas, business, finance, emotions, relationships, spirit, whatever, that's a skill. But it's a science because you can learn from other people. I, you know, I wrote a book called Money Master the Game. I interviewed 50 of the smartest financial people in the world, Ray Dalio, Carl Icahn, Warren Buffett, right, and found out what they did in common. Well, I applied that and took my little 50, $100 million companies and turned them into billion-dollar companies because I just modeled what they did. It's a science. But the thing that matters most in life, Mike, and I, I think, Evan, is that most of society misses is the more important skill is the art of fulfillment. Like if you succeed to seek succeed and you're always going for the next thing, you're you're on that, you're on that roller coaster, you're on that treadmill, right? You know, like the rat in the treadmill, and it, you got to find what fulfills you. We were talking that on yeah. one of our last comp. Were you right? Yeah. That what happens? What do you say? What happens so bad and it's so painful? We say, oh no, I can't take this anymore. No oh fuck no, pow. Yeah. When when people think that living is more painful than dying, that's when they try to take their life and knock on wood. The reason I've never lost anybody is I know how to shift that. I have to do it differently with every person because it'll take something different. Everyone is unique. Mm -hmm. But if you get somebody where they think dying would be much more painful than living, they're not going to take their life. Mm -hmm. no, they're going to do something different. What's your way in on that? Yeah, it's different every time. I got to dig. I got to understand the person because everybody has a different model of the world. Like some people's expectations, their belief systems are life should be taking care of me. Uh, I got to show people that life is calling to you. You need to deliver something to life because as long as you're waiting for somebody to take care of you, then you're always the victim. You're always waiting. Whereas if you think that I'm here to deliver something to life, I have a responsibility to life to give something, not just get something. That's when people feel alive because what you get never makes you happy, right? I always yeah. say to people, what's the greatest thing you've ever done, greatest achievement, and then how long were you happy after that? Five years? <laughs> A year, six months, a month, three weeks, three fucking hours, how long, right? And it's somewhere between three fucking hours and three months in most cases, right? Not much longer than that. I was saying, because we got to keep growing. It's not about getting the goal. Yeah. It's about who you become in pursuit of it. What you get doesn't make you happy. Who you become makes you really happy or it makes you really sad. And the beauty of you, Mike, is who you become. I mean, that's what's fucking inspiring, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, so brother. I love you, man. Fuck. I had a good. Is there um, anything? Go I had ahead, a good a mentor, and he has never believed in giving up. Yes, then that's you know, that's one of the most mentor. valuable things in life. You know. Yeah, that 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 part of your training and conditioning is the most valuable one because it got you here, brother. It got you through all the shit because you just wouldn't give up, and I'm I understand that completely. I wouldn't be here either if you really knew my whole story. It sounds really cool. Oh, yeah, he's got 54 companies, da da da, and you know, Mister Positive and shit like that. But if you saw the, the journey I went on. You know, you would be like, holy shit, someday I'll, I'll write a biography when I'm older. People's minds will be blown because they just have no clue what I've gone through to be here. But that's why I can deliver because I've been through the stuff. If you haven't been through it, it's it's just a concept. You've been through it, you have the experience to help people. Is there anything that you want to hit, hit before we get out of here, man? <laughs> I would just say to people I that, don't know what else we, we could possibly no, I cover. But. I would just say. How would you want them to get into contact with you? Oh, they, they can go to my website, TonyRobbins.com, or they can go on Instagram or Facebook or wherever they'd like. But uh, I just say that I hope that people listening will really consider one thing. How many people do you know that had everything and were miserable or even took their life? And so you got to find what's going to fulfill you. But what's going to fulfill you is not the same for every person. That's what's unique about it. That's why I call it the art, not the science. Science achievement, art of fulfillment. If you don't find what fulfills you, man, it's like you won't be able to make a difference for anybody else. It's like when you get on a plane and the first thing they tell you when you get on an airplane is uh, how to use your seatbelt as if you don't know that shit after 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And then they say, if there's a problem, this oxygen is going to pull out of the ceiling and these masks. And what do they tell you? The minute it comes in, immediately put it on your child. Right? Isn't that what they tell them? No, no. they put it on yourself. Yeah, your no, child. it sounds so freaking selfish. Why would you put it on you bastard? Your child's can't <laughs> breathe. But it's because if you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of your child. Yeah. And so what I found, and it's been a new lesson for me, I was a super achiever. I still know how to achieve. But now I'm much more interested in the fulfillment of life. I'm much more interested in savoring the moments. You know, I'm much more interested in finding what 
gives me juice because the more fulfilled I am, the more I can give, the more I can deliver because I'm fulfilled. I've got that oxygen in me. And I think you got to find that. And the only way you find that is you got to draw a line in the sand and stop the suffering. And most of us don't think of us as suffering. Like I'm an achiever. We don't even get fearful, right? We just get stressed. (laughs) Stress is the achiever word for fear. But I found that unless I really consciously break the pattern, the human mind is amazing. It's always, there's, you know, we got a two million year old brain in here and it's always looking for what's wrong so you can fight it or you can fight it or you can freeze, you know, try hopefully be left alone. But there is no saber tooth tiger anymore. So now people go life and death about what people think about them or they get life and death about money. When, you know, if you live in America and you're in total poverty, you're in the top 1% of earners on the or top 10% of earners on the planet. It's just crazy. You know, most people live on $2.50 a day around the world. So we have lost track of that. So my encouragement, if you're listening, if you have any interest in what the hell I'm saying is, fine, don't just achieve, but really take some time to figure out what are the things that are going to fulfill you and the ones you love and make sure you carve out time for that because it'll give you energy for all the other things that you want to deliver or achieve or create or give to the world. And I think, I hope people do that. And I hope people will remember the beginning of this conversation and get a blood test and check out your medals because you can handle it when it's early. You don't want to wait till it gets bad. Get your blood checked. Uh, and take care of your people. mental. Tony, <laughs> I got to say, man, out of everything that you do, my favorite part watching you come in here is you say hi to fucking everybody <laughs> and you look them in the eye and you shake their hand and you ask them how they're doing. It's like, dude, nobody does that. I love people. That's not, that's not, but I that's think not that's, work. that's, yeah, man. But people take that for granted. In this day and age of this. Yeah, no, I agree. You know, and that shit gives you juice. It does give you juice. To go up and feel someone's energy. Yeah, without a doubt. I want to, I want to make a difference. I know it sounds corny as shit, but I do. I just, I want to be a blessing. And then sometimes that blessing is just a smile or a connection or really acknowledging someone and they feel you really with them instead of, oh, hi, and moving on. Yeah. And sometimes that's saving a life. Sometimes that's giving them a skill. But what else are you going to do with your damn life, right? Yeah. You got to do something like, Absolutely. you know, something that makes your life feel like it's meaningful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we got a gift for you, brother. Oh, wow. Oh, this is going to be so my... cool. Uh, oh. This is so cool. Don't break it, Evan. I'll try not to. Oh, dude. wow. That is awesome, that's guys. That's a Greg Williams original photo signed by oh, Mike. Oh, that's brother. That's awesome. I to love it. Tony. <laughs> I love it with your birds, dude. Yeah. That's beautiful, brother. Hell yeah, brother. That's, that's awesome, you. man. Thank you so much. That's Absolutely. gorgeous. Let me make sure the camera can see it. That's gorgeous. Oh, that's really awesome. Thank you, brother. That's gorgeous. I really appreciate it. Anyway, thank you guys. It's been fun. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, brother. Thank you so much. God bless, brother. All right, Mike. Awesome. It's another awesome episode of Hot Boxing. Thank you very much, Tony Robbins. I'm Mike Tyson. I'm Evan Britton. Saying good night, y'all. See ya. (laughs) Peace. Blessings. 